G'day and welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm Alan Giles, an emergency physician, and today we're going to look at shoulder dislocations. That's pretty common. So I thought what we should look at is some of the relevant anatomy, the sort of types of shoulder dislocations, and a little bit about you know, reduction techniques we can use. So let's do some relevant anatomy. So the shoulder joint we're talking about is between the head of the humerus and the glenoid of the scapula. Uh, now it's got quite a loose capsule and it's actually the most mobile joint in your body. There's a couple of important things, in fact there's three areas that are important for the stability of this shoulder joint. The first is that the glenoid has around it a fibrocartilage labrum or rim and this actually deepens the socket for the humeral head. Next, there's some glenohumeral ligaments anteriorly. The inferior, there's actually three of them there for most people. Some people don't have the middle one, so superior, middle, and inferior. And the inferior is the most important. And you can see those ligaments there. The last and, you know, really very important is that uh, the rotator cuff muscles, remember there, the supraspinatus, symphospinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. When you contract your deltoid, they contract at the same time and they squeeze the humeral head into the socket. So these things are important for stability. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the most common type of dislocation, which of course is the anterior dislocation. Anterior dislocations tend to occur when you've got an abducted arm and you're struck from behind and the shoulder, the humeral head goes bang out anteriorly and lands somewhere around here. So where it lands is where they name it from. Subglenoid, subcoracoid, subclavicular. And you can see these sort of x-rays here of, of, um, of those different positions. When the patient presents to the emergency department, well, they'll be in pain. And you can usually see that they'll have their arm a little bit externally rotated, maybe a little bit abducted. They'll, most often you'll see this characteristic epaulette sign, the squaring off of the shoulder. And if you look carefully, you'll be able to see some fullness anterior where the humeral head is compared to the other side. Uh, the um, examination, you should make sure that you do the neurovascular examination, do perfusion distally as you normally would. And your neurological examination, make sure you check for the um, axillary nerve, the sensation over a sort of badge area over the deltoid. Document that before and after relocation. One of the questions that comes up is, do you need to x-ray these anterior shoulder dislocations if it's clinically quite obvious? Well, if it's a recurrent dislocation, I would say you probably don't have to. Um, if there hasn't been a significant force occurring with a recurrent dislocation, so it's got a quite a loose shoulder, then I would concentrate on putting it back in with a good technique rather than waiting for a, an x-ray. If it's the first time it's come out or it's happened with significant force, then I think an x-ray is worthwhile because you also might see that they'll have a fracture. While we're talking about x-rays, um, this is from the AP we're looking at, you can sometimes see also a hill sax deformity. Uh, this, as the shoulder, the head of the humerus comes out, it whacks on the anterior aspect of the um, of the glenoid and you can have like a wedge side posterior lateral um, wedge like defect in the humeral head and it's got a hill sax deformity. Okay, um, while we're on x-rays you can also get a transscapular view and you can see where the head sits. The head should sit inside the glenoid in this sort of wire Mercedes sign. If it's sitting anterior, it's an anterior dislocation. Okay, so let's get on to the important thing of how do you put it back in? Well, I'm not going to go through the history, the thousands of years of history of how people have tried to put in shoulders from Hippocratic method, Spazo method, yada, yada. There's lots of different methods. I'll concentrate on some of the basic principles of it. First of all, when the shoulder first comes out and you're there, it will often go back in with a little bit of traction and external rotation. And we can see that on the video here. Yeah, clonks back in. By the time they get to you in the emergency department, they'll often have some muscle spasm, they'll be in a reasonable amount of pain. 
And I think you need to have a technique you can do without significant sedation and also a technique you'll do with significant sedation. The technique which I would use would be a variation of the Cunningham technique. That is that you sit across with the patient and you take control of the arm. You take the weight of the arm and you talk to the patient and you slowly massage the trapezius and the deltoid and then you do a little bit of elevation very slowly, it might be over a minute, it might be over 10 minutes, and then a little bit of external rotation and make sure that you talk to the patient, you gain their confidence and you just make sure you keep it inside their ability to, um, to take any sort of pain that they're feeling. And then often it will just go clunk back in. Now there are some patients where you'll need to do more than this. And one of the things I just want to bring up before moving to the deep sedation is that if you're going to be doing any significant external rotation, make sure you get someone to hold and control the angle of the scapula. Because if you rotate the humerus outwards without doing that, the whole um, shoulder joint will come with it and you won't get effective rotation. So get someone to control the angle of the scapula and it'll plonk back in a bit easier. Okay, so going back to the deep sedation. Well, for some patients, combination of compliance, muscle spasm, uh, we may not be able to get in with the sort of the technique we just spoke about then. So these patients, good deep sedation technique, and then a combination of just some traction and external rotation, they'll be relaxed, it should go back in nice and easily, and you can see that sort of appearance here. Okay, let's go on to the much more uncommon dislocations, the posterior uh, and then the inferior dislocation. So posterior dislocations have a bad record, they've got a bad rap because they're often either missed or delayed. To get a posterior dislocation, you need a fair bit of force. I mean, you can get it from an, it just being smashed anteriorly in a motor, motor vehicle accident, but more commonly you get forced internal um, rotation that occurs when you've got seizures, electrical injury, and, chunk, and it forces it posteriorly. The reason that it's probably missed, well first of all I don't think people are actually examining very well because the patient's arm will be internally rotated and adducted. They can't move it very much at all, it hurts like buggery, and you can often feel posteriorly that um, humeral head. But if you just look at the x-ray, the x-ray can be missed. I mean, it's internally rotated, which is why it looks a little bit like a light bulb. So this is considered the light bulb sign. If you did a transscapular view, you'll see that the head of the humerus will be behind posterior to that Y or Mercedes sign that we spoke about before with the anterior dislocations. Okay, so you've got a posterior dislocation. Look, it is awkward to get back in. This and the next video afterward, I'd just like to thank uh, Professor Larry Millick from the University of Georgia. So here you can see for the posterior dislocation, there's traction, there's counter-traction, and the, the um, actual head itself is being pushed laterally by an assistant. Awkward to get in, and it needs to be done under deep sedation, um, but it can go in and can come back in with a satisfying clunk. So let's move on to the much less commonly, the really quite rare inferior dislocation, or luxio erecte, where you've had severe abduction of the arm uh, forcibly, and the, um, you've got the head has gone inferiorly here. Under these circumstances, again, it's quite awkward to get back in. You need deep sedation and a combination of axial traction and, as can be seen from this video here, some counter traction and then to bring it back into position. So what happens with these patients? Well, with an anterior dislocation, if it's a simple anterior dislocation, then you know, contact orthopedics and they'd usually do an outpatient review of the patient um, and send them home with analgesia and a sling. Um, and they can get early physiotherapy linked in via their local doctor. For the posterior dislocations, remember they have a lot of force to do this, 
and the inferior, rare dislocations, I think you should be speaking to orthopaedics when they're in hospital at that time in the emergency department. And they might want to come down and assist with some of the relocation techniques. Okay. Look, I think that'll just about do for shoulder dislocations and relocations. And one coffee. Thanks, I'll see you next time. Cheers.